What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. Hope everyone had a great weekend. I found this article this morning, which I wanted to share, and there are a few people out there who are not having a great weekend because according to Pamela McClintock over at The Hollywood Reporter, Ant-Man got pretty beat up over the weekend, and I'd seen some headlines yesterday that the film had a, a drop of 71% in its second weekend. That number's been revised a little bit, and these numbers typically do get revised by Sunday. But the fact remains, here's still the headline. Marvel's Ant-Man 3 gets mauled by Cocaine Bear, suffers record 69.7% drop. And as far as optics are concerned, having a number with a 6 in front instead of a 7 in front, it makes it slightly less bruising. But here is the reality. For every superhero movie that's ever been made that um, opened with more than $100 million on its opening weekend, this is the worst decline in, in the second week ever for a superhero flick. Here's the way they put it in the article. Marvel and Disney's Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania may have stayed atop the domestic box office chart in its sophomore outing with $32.2 million, but the real superhero of the weekend was Universal's high-concept genre pick, Cocaine Bear. Ant-Man fell 69.7% in North America, the worst decline ever for a title in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, after eclipsing Black Widow's 67.8% drop. The latter pick had the disadvantage of opening during the pandemic and was made available simultaneously in the home. And just to compare this to another Marvel movie that came out recently, last year's Thor Love and Thunder saw the biggest decline, or 67.7%, after debuting at 144.2 million. And so for me, what's always fascinating, anytime a film is a hit or a flop, and this is not a flop, it's probably going to end up, you know, more or less just underperforming will be the, uh, the kind way to put it. But anytime a movie seriously underperforms, I always enjoy the kind of armchair quarterback or Monday morning quarterbacking as to the reasons why. And everybody always likes to pretend like their excuse or their explanation is absolutely the reason why the movie un underperformed. And usually it's a combination of many factors. But the reason I find this so fascinating is that an R-rated movie about a cocaine bear in its opening weekend, a movie which was made for $35 million, the fact that it was even able to compete with a Marvel film in its second weekend is amazing to me. And people always like to complain about the taste of the American public, like, or as the old expression goes, no one ever went broke by underestimating the taste of the American public. But every once in a while, the American public can be surprising. And I'm not going to say that Cocaine Bear is some sort of thematically rich, sophisticated, complex film that shows how sophisticated audiences are. But it is at least an R-rated movie, and I like R-rated movies more than PG-13 movies, so I'm thrilled to see that Universal is kind of, you know, taking a, taking a piece out of the ass of Marvel, so to speak, with a big old bear bite. And since the launch of the MCU back in 2008 with Iron Man, this feels like the first time where a lot of critics and a lot of audience members have been in total alignment when it comes to their mutual disdain of a Marvel film. I mean, for years, Every Marvel flick was always in like the high 90s on Rotten Tomatoes or at a minimum like the low 90s. And obviously the crowd was pretty much universal in their love of the franchise, even if some of the movies were less satisfying than others. And it's starting to feel like there's a real chance in the next year or two where a Marvel film could outright flop. It's never happened. We've seen flops in Pixar. We've seen flops in Star Wars. We've seen flops in different franchises and different brands. But Marvel's been more or less bulletproof for 15 years. And I think that's over. But getting back to the reasons why this movie might be underperforming, there are a whole host of reasons, some more valid than others. But some people are going to say that it's due to Marvel fatigue or superhero fatigue. I'm not as big on that excuse just because I feel like a good movie helps people overcome their fatigue. Some people are going to say that it lacks a major star like Robert Downey Jr., et cetera, and so forth. But I'm less big on that as well. And a lot of people are going to talk about Disney's role in the ongoing pop culture wars and the creative direction of our major franchises. But here's my theory, and it's real basic. There's an old expression, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And I think the screenplay by Jeff Loveness just completely, totally sucks. And I said so in my review. And if Marvel is smart... They're going to want to uh, avoid working with him in the future. And after I posted my review, somebody on Twitter said, bad news, he's writing Avengers Kang Dynasty. And I was like, oh my God, because Marvel's all about building toward these giant events. And these, and these giant events usually are focused on the Avengers and a big recurring villain, obviously, like the first 
10 years of Marvel was all about putting the Avengers together and having them fight Thanos. And that whole 10 year plan worked out really well. The whole secret sauce to the Coca-Cola formula of Marvel has been that people are almost more interested in the post credit scenes. They're more interested in the overall plan and they would never consider missing any chapter. But if all of Marvel is building toward yet another movie written by Jeff Loveness, I'm sorry, like my, my enthusiasm for Marvel will reach an all time fucking low. And I don't wanna completely reiterate my review. I'll just post a link to it down in the description. But Jeff Loveness, he's one of those guys where his style of humor might have worked in the writer's room for a show like Rick and Morty, but it's a very poor fit for Marvel. I mean, case in point would be the character Modoc. He behaved in a ridiculous fashion. He looked ridiculous. I mean, some of the worst special effects I've ever seen. Historically, the character of Modoc has nothing to do with Kane the Conqueror. He has much more to do with advanced idea mechanics or AIM, those uh, dudes in the yellow suits with the, uh, the beehive helmets. But just throwing him in there just felt like one of those stupid ideas that might have been funny on a 20-minute episode of Rick and Morty, but it was just disastrous here. But more alarming is the way that Jeff, Lo Jeff Loveness writes his characters. I thought he made Cassie Lang intensely unlikable, outright annoying. I mean, having her just basically berate and talk shit to her father for more or less half the film, Scott Lang is perhaps the most likable character in the MCU, so why would you turn the daughter into a total bitch and ranting and raving about all of her political causes and all that nonsense? I'd be very curious to hear if Jeff Loveness got any pushback to any of his ideas along the way because he is the sole screenwriter on this movie. And also for every screenwriter out there ordinarily, it would be a dream project to have a movie where Bill Murray, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Michael Douglas are reading your lines of dialogue. They've been thrilling movie lovers for decades and he just wrote the world's lamest characters for all three of them. Michelle Pfeiffer's character was very busy, but very boring. Michael Douglas might as well not have been in the movie. And Bill Murray clearly was just ching ching, just ringing the register and going home. And as far as like the, I guess the, uh, the revolt against Kang as this totalitarian dictator is concerned, all those characters down in the uh, and down in the quantum realm were so bland, so generic, just so one dimensional. Their big giant revolt at the end of the movie might as well have not even happened because there was no emotional investment in it in any way, shape, or form. So long story short, I don't think Jeff Loveness can write his way out of a paper bag to borrow an old phrase. Marvel should fire him and cut all ties with him. And if they keep him on board and allow him to be the architect of the next big Avengers movie, it will be a complete and total disaster. So what does the future hold for Marvel? I'll be, I'll be curious to see if the stock takes a beating at all on Monday. Obviously, recently Bob Iger came in to help course correct the studio. His job just became considerably more difficult because if the trains aren't running on time at Marvel, well, Disney's movie empire is very much, I wouldn't say in jeopardy, but definitely diminished. And we've been hearing a lot of news lately about a lot of their streaming shows being delayed, which is always not necessarily a bad sign, but can be. But the big delays for the film, The Marvels, which has been delayed twice now and is now coming out in November, apparently had some disappointing test screenings. I have a feeling that movie, under the best of circumstances, was going to be a lightning rod of controversy that would divide the Marvel fan base, and it seems like all signs are pointing toward The Marvels potentially being an even bigger underperformer than Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, but we, we haven't seen a trailer, we haven't seen anything. All we've seen is a poster, so who the hell knows? And when Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 comes out in May, for a brief shining moment, I have a feeling that everyone's gonna pretend as if all's well in Marvel, My, myself included. I got genuinely emotional watching the trailer to the latest Guardians of the Galaxy film, but once that movie comes out, there's nothing left at Marvel to look forward to from a filmmaking perspective. I know everybody loves certain characters like the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, and I love them too. I grew up reading those comics. I, I love them dearly. But if you don't have great filmmakers, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to suck ass moving forward. If you're losing people like James Gunn and embracing people like Jeff Loveness, yeah, I think the, uh, the future is bleak for the Marvel brand. And so I'm almost kind of looking at GOTG Volume 3 as kind of the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe this May. But who knows, maybe I'm reading too much into this film's performance. Maybe it's just a standalone bad movie and Marvel will bounce back. But I'd be curious to hear from other people, like, does anybody want to see more movies about the multiverse and more timelines and all this crap? Because I feel like the multiverse 
It's starting to make the whole universe feel like nothing really matters because characters who are dead can come back. Characters who were previously in different continuities can be brought in. And it just becomes a big sandbox with no sense of stakes or drama. And what they're, what Marvel's starting to miss or lack is that gritty, visceral intensity that we saw in Winter Soldier, Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame, where that writing team and directing team, that was kind of the beating heart or like the main pulse of the Marvel Cinematic Universe for, for so long. And I don't know if any of those writers or directors are ever coming back. But anyway, Bob Iger, like I said before, he's got his work cut out for him over the next two years. But as far as commentary goes, the next few years are going to be a very interesting time when it comes to discussing the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Disney, etc. and so forth. But thank you so much for watching my video. I greatly appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. But I hope everyone has an amazing week. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.